I'm Rick Bullock, and I am here with my cohort in crime. Barbara Shagnon. And we are here today to bring to you some phenomenal news. Uh, sometimes we do things tongue-in-cheek, sometimes we do things on a more serious basis. But this is a phenomenal opportunity for you people out there in our viewing audience to see what we see and to see what we feel. In the sense that we have done a collaboration with the Bedford Historical Society and our parent company to bring you a living history of Bedford. Now, I want to tell you that I've been learning a lot from doing this living history. I'm new to town. I've only been here a few years. I have virtually no knowledge of Bedford's history other than that which Rick has already shared with me from his family history. The stories these folks are coming out with is just phenomenal. We want you to be able to enjoy some of these stories with us and we hope that you'll have a smile on your face as you're watching them and remembering and laughing. And I think part of the situation has got to be you keep an open mind because you're going to find out things about your community that there is no way you would ever find out any other way because so much of our community is the living history, which is why it's called that. So we'll be seeing you in segments following and other segments, and we wish you a happy day. <laughs> My memory returns to the old farm where I was born. And this was the home of many of my great greats with names, name of French on my mother's side. It is now known as Brick Ends for Bedford Center Road behind Town Hall, but had been known as the Granite Farm of Freeman R. French, my grandfather. Presbyterian Church, at the time I was growing up, was the only church in town. Um, if you were Protestant, you sort of ended up at the Presbyterian Church, whether you were a Methodist or whatever. And, and if you were, were <laughs> and if you were Catholic, then you had to go to, into Manchester. So a lot of our activities were church connected, uh, like you talked about the lawn party and the, uh, the the suppers and things that were held at the uh, town hall. It was very connected to clubs and church at that point in time. There wasn't anything else going on until they opened up the Bedford Grove. The sky over the eastern hills is just beginning to show a lot of color. It is four o'clock in the morning as our Bedford farmer pulls on his boots. This is the year 1900 in farming town of Bedford, New Hampshire. Bedford was so small. It was, That everybody yes. knew everybody. They did. So mm -hmm. there wasn't that fear of, of, you know, at this point if my granddaughters were to get into somebody's car, I don't know who I'd shoot first, but right. the issue is, it. it, it it's a different kind mm -hmm. of a situation. Yeah. So I, I guess that, that one of the things that, that comes to mind, and, and there's so much I want to talk to you about, Gwen, but you were telling me some interesting stories I did not even know about your dad and running the wagon wheel. Mm -hmm. Can you share those with, with us here today? Because I mean, I just found it fascinating because I can remember, and I, let me preface it with this, uh, there was an older lady that lived over on National Road. That house has now gone to as many of our more historic structures are. And a friend of mine and I were riding by one day, and she stopped us and asked us to go to the wagon wheel and get her a pack of cigarettes. Now, we were probably 10, 11, I don't even think 12. But she gave us the money, which I think was something like 40 cents. Maybe she gave us a 50 cent piece, but whatever it was. And we went to the came down National Road, crossed, came up Bell Hill Road, came across North Amos Road Extension, got to the wagon wheel, went in, and Mr. Earl uh, was there. And we said that we had come for Mrs. Kabulis had sent us for cigarettes. Did we ever get stared down? And finally it took a phone call or two 
to Mrs. Kabliss before he would even let us touch a pack of cigarettes, let alone anything else. But, you know, that's, that's the way things were, where, you know, storekeepers uh, were also your friends, and they would watch out for the kids in the neighborhood and, and the community. And as opposed to looking and saying, okay, my bottom dollar is I sell this, I make this, they would actually question us. And your dad would, would I can remember that as though that much was yesterday. But tell us a couple of those things about your dad. Well, and, and I, he never told me who this was, but there was a, a young child that came in and stole candy. And the candy counter was right up by the register, and he caught him, and um, he took the child out. He says, "Are you? why did you take that? And the child says, I was hungry. He says, well, put that back. And he brought him down to the back of the store, and he told him he could have a, a banana, an apple, orange, or he said, I'll make you a bologna sandwich. Anytime you're hungry, you come in and tell me, and I'll feed you, but you're not going to steal from me. And that child, I'm sure, never stole again. But he didn't, he didn't tell his parents. And, but that's, you know, he felt, he felt the need to bring up kids. Well, I, I, think, <laughs> I think that goes back to the, the, the issue of it really takes a village to raise a child. Sure. And I Well, my biggest one is, well, the, the French's store was partly family owned. My grandfather owned the building and uh, my aunt and uncle and Ralph Wigan ran it at varying times. But it's the wagon wheel that I remember the best because we used to get an allowance once a week so we could go across from school to go to the, to the wagon wheel to get our penny candy. I think we got all of a nickel a week or some silly thing like that. That's a lot. Oh, I know, but it didn't seem like it when we went to buy our candy. <laughs> well, I guess I walked to school. I probably, my father took me probably when I was going to first grade. I can't quite remember that. But uh, then event eventually I, he would pick me up for lunch, and I'd go home for lunch, then I'd come back to school. And then when Hebert's was there, sometimes I would take my lunch and then we'd go over there and get an ice cream or something and to that's drink. that's the wagon wheel. Wagon wheel, that's right, right the wagon wheel. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, but you didn't have a hot lunch program the way No, no, know. nothing like that, no. You see, when I went to see this as well, there was a, a, a hot lunch program downstairs. Uh -huh. And boy, those benches were hot. <laughs> I, I can remember that. The uh, primary dishes I can remember it was on Friday, it was fish sticks, uh -huh. which were basically uh -huh. uh, mashed potatoes and made wallpaper case with lid. Mm -hmm. And you could actually melt them down somewhat with a squeeze bottle of ketchup, <laughs> which inevitably somebody would take and squeeze and shoot it halfway across the right, right. Well, um, I had um, a pony and so I was able to uh, explore some of Bedford on my pony. And my pony became used in a whole variety of ways, too. I can remember my father trying to plow our vegetable garden, and I had to get on my pony and pull the little hand plow that he used to go up and down the aisle. How did that work, John? <laughs> <laughs> Every once in a while I had trouble because my father would say, you're stepping on the plants. <laughs> And so I had that, and then um, we had a little apple, we had an orchard, you know, a lot of families had some fruit trees around, and you picked for, for, for fruit and for pies and things. And so uh, with the pony, I could get a little bit higher so I could get to some of the... That pony the had a multiple <laughs> variety of uses. And then as you mentioned, 
Um, I used to ride my pony often with um, Bobby Chalmers mm -hmm. and their family, uh, not Chalmers, I'm sorry, Remick. Mm -hmm. And they lived just down the street, and he had a little pony too. So we used to ride, but we, at that time, the, r the uh, railroad wasn't in operation. It had sort of been uh, abandoned, but all of the ties were there, and the railroad still ran along what is now 101 through that kind of swampy area. And I used to go down there and put, try to go over the, the little ties. And of course, I, I just had a pony, but I would still try to jump him over the ties, and my father didn't appreciate that. So I could ride all the way along on the railroad track from where I lived over to Meeting House Road. And you know, that gave you quite a little ways to ride, and down to where the Caltons lived on the corner of, of uh, Liberty Hill and uh, Meeting House Road. Mm -hmm. Then I could also ride up into the center of town, which my uh, mother got a little worried about because I'd run the ride up with the pony to get ice cream at French's store which is right now, you know, it used to be in front of the Presbyterian Church, but it's, of course, gone now. It's the early 60s. Yeah, and that whole area was configured a little bit differently, but I could tie the pony on to one of the poles in front and go in and get my ice cream. And every once in a while, the pony would come untied, and then my mother would get all these calls. People would hand, call up and say, you know, uh, the pony's going through town, but Bootsy's not on it, was, was, was my <laughs> <laughs> nickname <laughs> back at those days. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, so that means that somewhere along the way, your Aunt Helen must have been the one putting the plug in. Right. And I can only imagine Helen's reaction to that call. Let's see. Tell me about things in the town hall. Oh gosh, that was fun. We had harvest suppers. Remember the rolled ham? Yes. Yeah. And of course, the Unity Club put on. Um, I don't know exactly what they called it. It was a show. Well, the, well they put on the lawn party. Yeah, the lawn party. But they also had a, because um, I remember being a can-can a -can girl. And it was a play or something. And, and I was, there were a group of young girls and did the can-can. And then um, teenagers and then adults. And we, we, they put on a whole show. And I was one of the can-can girls. I was a teenager girl. <laughs> Well, I'll try to read this. This was written by my father back in 1985. 
and it's Bedford 75 years ago, and he was thinking back to all of the changes that had occurred over the, the since, you know, in those, since the early 1900s. Life in Bedford Center has changed in three quarters of a century. The change has come on us so fast that one generation has slid into another generation without any awareness of the extent of the process. It is my hope to recall to the elders what happened in their youth and to the youth of today what changes can occur in just 75 years. What uh, did Bedford have back then when what that we do not have in Bedford Center now? First of all, we had the country store and the post office with boxes that could be rented. Mail came out from Manchester and then was delivered by horse and carriage to West Bedford homes and the rest of the homes in the center and southern part. Second, we had the railroad station and railroad to Milford. Grain came in for the store and cord wood was shipped out. Bedford was a farming community and the store was a center for news. The store owner sent a team to each home a team of horses, that is, to each home once a week to take orders for food and grain, and these were delivered the next day. We had a meat cart that came to the door once a week and a fish cart that came now and then. The roads were all dirt, although the main road was gravel. Many of these roads were very muddy in the spring. Uh, as our, at our home, we had kerosene lamps and a lantern for the barn. Our first electric line was for only two rooms. Two wires were nailed to the ceiling and there was a down wire with a bulb and a shade. We had an ice chest to keep the, the uh, food cold, so we needed an ice house to store the ice. In the winter, the ice was cut at Harrison Campbell's Pond. This was near the brook below the uh, water center. We also skated on this pond in the winter. We had sliding parties that started near the Soper house uh, where the Benedictine sisters uh, later lived, and then went past North Amis Road to the cider mill below on Wallace Road, just past the brook. There was a slaughterhouse at Irwin French's. At one time, cattle came in the railroads, came to the railroad station, and then were driven over the road to French's farm. Every home had a barn with at least a horse or more, and cows from two to 20. Where are these barns and animals today? You, if you sat on the porch, of the uh, store, you would see the milk wagons coming from Manchester after they had delivered milk to the homes. Yes, they delivered milk right to the door each in the early in the morning. Uh, you could see a load of loose hay headed for Blake's or for the ho horses at the Manchester Coal and Ice Company. In summer, you could see Charles Shepherd uh, leading three cows from Jim Hill's farm to a pasture on Church Road. You might see Mrs. Woodbury and her niece, Martha, on their way to visit the cemetery. On sunny days, Mrs. Woodbury would carry a parasol to cover her head. As you walked to the town hall, kids would pass you on bicycles as they raced back to school where the town office is today. Actually, it's the Stevens Buswell School. Uh, there were no school buses or school lunches. You would walk or ride a bike. Look, where are the beautiful maple trees that were in the town parking lot? Where are the rails we uh, hitched our horses to? The library door was on the other side of the building next to Mrs. Woodbury's laundry, later referred to as the little greenhouse which is something the Historical Society owns now. Uh, you would love our town hall. 
we had town meetings starting at 10 a.m. and we would stop for dinner and then return to business. Many suppers were served by the Grange and others. The Grange would have 200 people in their meetings many times. There were many places in the town hall and the Unity Club was started after a play. I mean, I'm sorry, there were many plays in the town hall. The big, the blue bag, this must have been a play. The cast had a party after the rehearsal and Mr. Matchett, who was the minister of the time, decided to uh, call a meeting to ask our thoughts. This was when the Unity Club was organized. There were many dances and the Christmas parties were really something. We would hear Santa coming from way down the road and then he would come through a window or fireplace on the stage. We got candy and a big orange uh, plus presents on a tree. The candy and the orange were most often given by the men's club. Outside the town hall stood Mrs. Woodbury's windmill. Kids were never to go up the windmill. At one time, the town hall had carbide lights. The carbide was uh, stored in the little house where the old fire station is now. There were kids who were on the fourth, uh, there were kids who, who on the 4th of July would take an eight quart milk can and using carbide um, gas to blow the uh, wooden stopper off the can with a big bang. This was dangerous and was considered a no-no. Uh, there were sliding or sled, uh, sledding parties on Woodbury Hill and skiing in Jim Hill's field. There were sled, uh, uh, sleigh ride parties from Manchester City Hall to our town hall for an oyster stew. Imagine that now. Sometimes there were as many as four or five teams of people. One of the things we miss the most at our town is our telephone exchange that had party lines and Helen French at the switchboard. Uh, our fire calls were well handled by Helen and her mother. One long ring and we would all listen in. We kids were trappers. We would catch muskrats, beavers, maybe a fox or a skunk. We would then uh, sell the skins to some furrier. It was great fun, but grown-ups didn't like it when we caught a skunk. <laughs> the one thing that most people would not want to go back to is the uh, toilet. It was in a cold shed or outhouse. It had the old Sears robot catalog or newspaper uh, handy. Baths were taken in the shed and in the winter in the kitchen by the stove. We used an old galvanized bath uh, tub. Bedrooms were never heated. We would undress by a cold stove, by, by the cold stove and run for the bedroom. Something else we no longer have here is the old dooryard call. You were mentioning that earlier, by the way. Yes. People driving by would stop and say hello and call and talk for 10 or 15 minutes. You know how people who have new cars love to show their friends the new um, toy? It may have been their first car or maybe a new horse that they all love to call. In the old days, I have known people to trade horses in one of these dooryard calls, or maybe a cow would be traded or sold. Sometimes the wife would go into the house and bring out a goodie or two that she had baked. Uh, boy, were the donuts good. Mrs. George H. Wigan often bought a cup of coffee and hot donut out to the mailman as he was delivering the mail in his sleigh. My, how things have changed in Bedford Center. Well, we hope that you liked that show. It was a lot of fun to do, and it was a great uh, experience being with people that we really found to be that interesting. Barb? I enjoyed listening to their stories. We hope that you did as well. 
I'm new in town, as I've said before, and I find it all intriguing. We hope that we'll hear from you, some comments that you may have. If you'd like to share with us, call us at 603-472-5051. Follow the prompts to get to the right mailbox because there's a few on that line. Or jot us an email, bedfordpositively at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you and we promise we'll get back to you. And I can only echo that, but part of this is the enjoyment really in being able to serve you. We have a great time doing these shows and it's a lot of fun and we hope that you're enjoying it with us. So we'll see you next time.